is the worst serial killer in Russia's history. He just liked to, to kill. His eyes are very unpleasant. He has the look of a cornered predator. For years, he kept a city in fear. For years, he taunted the police. We just wanted to catch him, to stop people being killed. He preyed on the lonely and vulnerable. He operated very, very carefully. And he kept a unique record of his crimes. Based on unprecedented access to Moscow's elite murder squad and unique police footage of a disturbing reenacted confession. This is the untold story of the hunt for Russia's most prolific serial killer. Moscow has experienced extraordinary changes since the dark days of the Cold War. Today, it's a place of fabulous wealth and grinding poverty. Of postcard cathedrals and tough housing estates. And it's also the backdrop for the most notorious serial killer in Russian history. Bitsa Park is an extensive wooded area covering 22 square kilometers of southern Moscow. It's a popular spot where ordinary Russians play chess or just enjoy a pleasant stroll. But for years, it hid a grisly secret. On Saturday, October the 15th, 2005, Moscow police find the dead body of 31-year-old Nikolai Worobiev. he suffered terrible injuries to the head. Denis Adamenko was one of the first policemen on the scene. It was here, exactly at this place, where we found one of the victims. Of course, when we found him, it wasn't a pleasant sight. It had numerous brain injuries, a bottle was stuck into the head and the brain was strewn all over the ground nearby. A month later, another body turns up, that of 63-year-old Nikolai Zakhachenko. Almost two weeks later, another, Vladimir Dedukin. And a week later, another, Nikolai Koryagin. By Christmas, seven bodies have been found murdered and mutilated in Bitsa Park. Not one of the bodies has been concealed, and none of the victims has been robbed, but all of them have the same horrific trademark injury, a vodka bottle or stick forced into the bloody, gaping wound at the back of the head. It was obvious from the beginning, it was a serial killer. Complex homicide investigations are handled by Moscow's elite murder squad. And their most senior and experienced investigator is Andrei Suprinenko. Often clashing with Moscow's criminal underworld and handling the city's most violent murders, he's used to dealing with complex and dangerous cases, the kind that cost his predecessor his life. I took this criminal case for investigation in February 2006, when it became clear that we were dealing with a serial killer. With seven bodies discovered by police and a serial killer on the loose, Moscow becomes a city in fear. Investigative journalist Yana Zhakinskaya is immediately drawn to the case and begins to cover the story for the Russian and British press. We realized that it's a serial killer, it's a maniac operating in, in Bitsa Park. We called him Bitsa Maniac. People were frightened and Bitsa Park is a very popular place for recreation. But the people were scared to go there because the, the, there was a feeling of danger. 
Despite discovering so many bodies, police have few clues to the identity of the Bitsa maniac. The killer didn't leave any trace. We tried to pick up different objects from the crime scene, but our analysis didn't show any trace. No fingerprints, nothing. He operated very, very carefully. The investigators need all the help they can get. They turn to the one man who can assist them. Professor Vladimir Warontsov is one of Moscow's most senior and experienced forensic examiners. He's been inspecting murder victims in the Russian capital for nearly 40 years. It falls to him to determine the exact nature of the victim's gruesome deaths. All the injuries were inflicted in the head area, and there were very many of them. The most massive injuries would be made on the back and side of the head and on the face. It was like a calling card for this criminal, his signature. These are the skulls of some of the victims found in Bitsa Park, and they have suffered massive injuries. Although the forensic evidence is very limited, Professor Warantsov is still able to determine the likely murder weapon. This fracture was made by an object with an angled edge. It could have been a hammer. But just who is the killer wielding the hammer in Bitsa Park? Within weeks, there's a sensational development which promises to unlock the whole mystery. By January 2006, Moscow police have seven unsolved murders on their hands, all battered with a hammer in Bitsa Park in southern Moscow. All with the same telltale injury, the neck of a vodka bottle embedded in the gaping wound at the back of the head. And for senior investigator Andrei Supranenko, there's virtually no evidence to go on. Whether the killer was a man, a woman or child, nobody knew anything. Whether he lived in the area or used to live there, whether he knew the park well, nobody knew anything. With little concrete information to go on, rumors and theories abound. But one place close by attracts the special attention of the investigators. Could the killer be right under their noses? There is a psychiatric sanatorium on the age, on the age of Bitsa Park. Some of the stable patients would be allowed to go for a walk to Bitsa Park. They would have a day release. And there was this theory that the killer could be the patient of this sanatorium who escaped and was hiding in Bitsa Park and killing people. A considerable number of people were checked. Anyone who was a bit suspicious was stopped and questioned by police. But without a prime suspect, the psychiatric patient theory goes nowhere. But then there was another more compelling line of inquiry. The victims were mainly men and middle-aged. They were really people nobody cared about and nobody would be looking for. We thought since it was only men who were the victims from the very beginning that it might be a woman. No one knew the real motives to the crimes. We were looking at various possibilities. 200 Moscow police stake out Bitsa Park. Their task is to stop and question anybody suspicious. But the park is vast. Covering an area of 22 square kilometers, their chances of catching the killer red-handed are remote. Stop! 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 Stop!
When the transvestite was detained, naturally it was suspicious. And then the police make a startling discovery. The transvestite is carrying a hammer in his bag. That guy felt like the right guy. But the transvestite claims he only has the hammer to protect himself against attack. When the story gets out, the press has a field day. We thought that this was the right guy and there were lots of papers with the headlines, the Bitsomaniac is caught. But the transvestite has a convincing alibi. We suspected he wasn't the killer by the end of the first day. But to check his alibi required almost 24 hours detailed work. And only after it was all done was he released. A week later, 25-year-old supermarket worker Mahmoud Zhaldashov is murdered. With each newly discovered body, the coverage in the media was getting more and more intense, and police and prosecution chiefs were pushing us to find and detain the killer as soon as possible. The pressure on the murder squad is becoming intense. They're struggling to keep on top of the growing body count, which now stands at 12. Additional investigators like Elena Pognazina are brought onto the case. We had to have a team ready for when new events hit us, new murders happened. Then there is a significant development. At some point, and there's a reason which wasn't clear for us, he switched to killing women. In April 2006, investigators find the body of 48-year-old supermarket worker Larissa Koligina. Two months later, they find a 14th victim. In June 2006, another body was discovered. A body of a woman with the same kind of wounds typical ones, like all the others before, so we knew we had another case to be investigated. Then investigators make a crucial discovery, a metro ticket in the murdered woman's coat. Investigators now begin an intensive trawl of the surveillance footage of the Moscow metro to see if they can find out who traveled with the woman that day. But it's an enormous task. Then, there is a further breakthrough. Two days later, police officers called me with a message that the son of the murdered woman had turned up and identified the body. The victim was 36-year-old single mother, Marina Moskolyova. She lived alone with her son, Sergei. When we interviewed him, he said his mom had gone out for a walk with a boyfriend, Sasha. She didn't come home. As investigators piece together Marina's last known movements, her son delivers a key piece of evidence. Before she left, Marina had tried to call her son on her mobile to tell him where she was going but it wasn't working. She left a note saying where she was going and who with. She left his name and phone number. The phone number was registered to a 32-year-old supermarket worker, Alexander Pechushkin. The name Alexander is often shortened in Russia to Sasha. This was our very first concrete clue leading us to Pechushkin. We establish his address at once. At the same time, the investigators uncover the video from the security cameras at the metro station. While scoming through the videos, we found Moskalova with a stranger walking together inside the metro station. 
These are the last images of Marina Moskalyova alive. She doesn't know it, but she's walking with a man who has a hammer in his bag and who fully intends to kill her. That man is Alexander Pichushkin. The video confirmed it was really him, together with Moskalyova, which was the proof we needed to arrest him and accuse him of the murder of Marina Moskalyova. On the 16th of June, we arrested Pichushkin. It was in the evening. It was dark. 10, 11 p.m. He was absolutely calm and denied everything at the beginning. At the point he was detained, he was only suspected of Moskalyova's murder. But with the evidence mounting up against him, the note left by the murdered woman and the video images of her last moments alive, the investigators are sure they have the right man. And Pichushkin soon realizes it himself. They usually confess. Everybody confesses eventually. I didn't have any doubts. Investigator Pomazina is right. Within a few hours, Alexander Pichushkin confesses to the murder of Marina Moskalyova. After eight months' painstaking work, the investigators have their man. Of course, when we arrested the killer, we were all very satisfied. Investigators are now able to piece together Marina's last moments. She'd met Pichushkin on June the 13th. He'd asked her out for a picnic in the park. He said, I was sitting there with her for a very long time, really long, wondering whether to kill her or not. And eventually I decided to kill her because I felt that if I didn't, life would become torture for me. Investigators suspect Pichushkin of committing 14 murders in Bitsa Park. But what comes next is a complete shock. Of course, none of us could expect the true number of crimes he had committed. It's an astonishing confession. When he confessed, it was a complete shock for everyone because it's an enormous, enormous figure. 60 victims would make Pichushkin Russia's most prolific serial killer. More prolific even than the depraved ripper of Rostov, Andrei Chikatilo. We needed to check it all, which was going to be a great deal of work to do. And then the investigators find something that make them think Pichushkin's story might just possibly be true. After Pichushkin was detained, there was a search of his flat. We got the chessboard with numbers pasted on it. Each figure, each number meant a crime. I wanted to kill one person but was this extraordinary confession true? He might have said anything, but we couldn't believe his words unless we had proof. 
And to get that proof, they were going to have to get inside the mind of Russia's most prolific serial killer. In June 2006, after finding 14 bodies in Bitsa Park, the Moscow murder squad arrest Alexander Pichushkin on suspicion of being the Bitsa maniac. But under interrogation, Pichushkin confesses to not just the 14 they know about. He says he has killed more than 60 people, making him the most prolific serial killer in Russian history. But is his claim true? Each of the claims has to be individually checked and proven. It's an enormous task. One of the names Petrushkin provides to investigators is that of Vladimir Fomin, a young man who vanished without trace in 2003. Nikolai Fomin recalls the day his son disappeared. Well, he left on October the 14th, 2003, at about 7 in the evening, to buy cigarettes. We never saw him again. He was a very good, responsive, kind man. He helped all his friends and took care of his newborn child. In 2006, investigator Pumirzina called me. She asked me to come for an interview to Leninsky Prospect. And there I learned that all the cases about the missing people had been combined into one case, the Pichushkin case. To continue building their case against him, prosecutors need to keep Pichushkin talking. The job falls to Valeria Sushkova. My job was to keep him talking, to establish a psychological relationship with him. It was terrible to hear what he was saying, even for me as an experienced investigator, to hear the pleasure and delight in his voice. This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. When he described how he smashed their skulls and pushed sticks and bottles into their wounds. In Russia, to avoid any doubt in court, investigators take the accused back to the scene of the crime and get them to reenact exactly what happened, and they film the results. In the case of Pichushkin, investigators need to verify his astonishing claims, but they are also keen to deny him the obvious pleasure he takes from reliving his brutal acts of murder. Investigator Maxim Zharkov is the official cameraman. I traveled with Pichushkin to Bitsa 27 times in all, and filmed over 40 hours of video with him. Pichushkin has an amazing memory for the details of his crimes.
The fact that he remembered what to him were the significant moments in the tiniest of details was very helpful. He knew the woods very well and showed us the exact places where he was killing people. Denis Adamenko is the officer handcuffed to him throughout his confessions in the forest. I only had one thought. I wanted him to show us as many as he could, to tell us everything, where he dumped people, where he left them. I wanted as much evidence as I could get. But the case against Petrushkin can't just rely on his confession. When forensic investigators examine the head wounds of Boris Grishin, a 64-year-old man who was killed in Bitsa Park on December the 19th, 2005, they make an intriguing discovery. We found bits of plastic in the wounds when examining the skin samples. Our preliminary conclusion was that this bit of plastic could be part of the object used to strike the blows. Moscow police recovered this hammer. Petrushkin claims to have used it. But they need to prove that it is in fact the murder weapon. As we were studying the hammer, we found some deep scratches on the surface of part of the handle at a point close to the head. And as we compared it to the particles we found, it became very clear that they were part of this handle. During his filmed confession, Petrushkin reveals many extraordinary murders and also how, as a killer, he grasped any opportunity to take a life. All his actions were designed to commit as many murders as possible. On January the 18th, 2002, Petrushkin met a 40-year-old homeless man called Slavo. At the time, people thought it was a suicide. Nobody saw anything criminal about it at all. He knew perfectly well what was going on. He knew what he was doing. As the investigators delve further, they build up a precise picture of the man who claims to have killed over 60 people. Petrushkin was born in Moscow on April the 9th, 1974. His background seemed ordinary. He lived with his mother and sister in this apartment on Hersonskaya Street. It's a typical Soviet-era flat, not far from Bitsa Park. He had a steady job in a supermarket and was generally well-liked. His was an ordinary, everyday life. Yet Alexander strove to be different. A team of doctors at Russia's leading psychiatric institute spent over six months analyzing Pichushkin's background and psychiatric history. And one of them is Dr. Evgeny Mikushkin. He wasn't happy in his private life. He just did his job and led a lonely life. As far as we know, he tried to live with women on several different occasions and even tried to start a family, but he failed. The pattern of behavior that we were witnessing was very complicated. But there was a certain pattern, a striving to murder and to aggressive sadistic activity. So why was he doing all this? 
to get a kick out of it, to get satisfaction and a sexual release. Certainly, this is a display of aggressively sadistic syndrome, aggression and cruelty, a discharge of his aggressive intentions. His one gift was a knack for getting on with people and putting them at their ease. He could make an acquaintance easily and found it easy to keep contact with them without ever giving his victims a chance to relax and feel the danger. And when the right moment came, he just smashed their heads in. During the 40 hours of filmed confession in the forest, Pichushkin continues to horrify investigators with the scale of his killings. Pichushkin led us to the site of a murder we didn't even know about, and there we found the remains of a man who had never been discovered. The jawbone belongs to a 36-year-old worker from St. Petersburg, Oleg Lorinenko. It was a rather remote place in the forest, and unfortunately, there was little left of that man. Where then animals had spoiled the body, and there was practically nothing left. Lorinenko is Pichushkin's 15th victim found in the forest. But the chessboard killer claims to have murdered more than 60 people. So where are the other 45 bodies? Trawling their records, investigators are drawn to an unsolved crime in Bitsa Park four years earlier. In February 2002, local police received a call from a hospital about a patient with curious injuries. Maria Vericheva had a worrying story about a man she'd recently met, a man called Alexander Pichushkin. On February the 23rd, 2002, Maria had met Alexander Pichushkin near Khakhovskaya metro station. She just split up from her boyfriend and was desperate to make ends meet. Pichushkin offered to sell her some cameras. He told her he'd hidden them in Bitsa Park. Maria Vericheva was pregnant at the time. Carried along by the quick flowing water, Vidicheva managed to cling to life by climbing into a disused sewer. <laughs> After being trapped for more than 20 hours, she eventually found the strength to climb from the sewer. At the time, despite Vericheva's detailed statement, local police decided not to pursue the investigation. I mean, she knew who tried to kill her and knew where to find him. But the local policeman asked her not to push it just because he didn't want to deal with what he thought was a rubbish case. He thought it wasn't important. I didn't want to do extra work. 
there was a real missed opportunity. There was a chance of, to catch him much, much earlier and to save about over 20 lives, I think. The sewers proved the key to uncovering how Pichushkin disposed of the rest of his victims. Alexander, what is this? Ну вот в этом колодце я вот так делаю. Сколько всего человек? Ну сейчас сколько? По подсчетам получается человек 16. Можно более точно. This is just one of the sewers Pichushkin used. There is a network of drainage systems beneath Bitsa Park, serving all of southern Moscow. In terms of physical damage, you know when he was throwing them down into the sewers. Those people, if I can say so, they were rather lucky because their deaths were pretty instant. There are such massive water flows there and such huge water pressure that when we put a mannequin inside the sewer to see what it's like there, it was simply torn apart. Pichushkin disposed of many of his victims in this way, including his very first victim, Mikhail Odinchuk, an 18-year-old classmate whom Pichushkin murdered in 1992. Odinchuk had refused to partner Pichushkin on a killing spree. Then, in February 2002, Pichushkin dumped the body of a homeless boy known only as Mitka, who was just nine years old. Pichushkin claims to have dumped the bodies of some 43 people in the sewers beneath Bitsa Park. He even blamed us for not being able to find all the bodies. Seriously, he blamed us for not working hard enough. We even had to say that if he hadn't thrown the bodies into the sewers, if he was to leave them on the ground, we would have found them all. But one question remains. Just why does Pichushkin change from disposing of his victims in the sewers, where they just disappear, to leaving them in the open, where they're almost guaranteed to be found? I got the impression that he couldn't keep it to himself, that he needed everyone to know. He wanted to get full credit, as he saw it, for what he was doing. I think deep in his heart he wanted to be caught. He just, he wanted the attention and he wanted the fame and he just couldn't keep silent anymore. Alexander Petrushkin is about to get his moment in the spotlight. Moscow prosecutors have built up a solid case against him with enough evidence to charge him with 49 individual counts of murder. Under the gaze of the world's media, the chessboard killer has one last game to play. On September the 13th, 2007, Russia's most prolific serial killer, Alexander Pichushkin, goes on trial in Moscow, charged with the murder of 49 people. It's the culmination of a killing spree that has lasted for over 15 years and has kept an entire city in fear. I attended the court hearings. It was a real performance for him. He, it, it, he wanted the attention and that there was the place where, where he could get that. There was the jury, there were the press, there were the prosecutors and judge and it was all about him and he was really enjoying that. All he wanted was for the jury to be present in court so that he had as big an audience as possible. And he spoke with great pleasure in court about all the things he did. He was really enjoying it. This is Petrushkin's moment in the limelight, and he plays it to the full. He is asked if he has any regrets. Petrushkin paused for a minute and then said, Yes, I do regret one thing. I regret you arrested me so early. I was planning to murder another woman in two days' time. 
Each day the trial heard about six episodes, five or six murders. Pichushkin was very reserved, only nodded when they were asking him questions. Yes, I did it. Yes, it was me. For everyone, it was shocking. We thought he will at least say forgive me to those people whom he killed. He showed no, absolutely no remorse. But is the man who claims to have killed more than 60 people sane? An insane person cannot realize the consequences of his actions. But here the subject's actions were purposeful and consistent, and he was aware of what he was doing. That is why the expert commission came to the conclusion that he was sane. After a trial lasting six weeks, the jury takes less than three hours to return a unanimous verdict. And on Monday, October the 29th, 2007, Judge Vladimir Usov pronounces sentence. The Russian state and the chief prosecutor are proud of the result. Pichushkin will spend the rest of his life behind bars. The first 15 years will be in solitary confinement. For Nikolai Fomin, the sentence provides justice for the cruel death of his son, Vladimir. There is no punishment higher than life imprisonment. This is as much as you can get. So he will stay in jail for life. Despite the guilty verdict, Vladimir Fomin's body has never been recovered. A fact that provides some small solace for his family. This is hope. This is hope. If there is no body, the person may be alive. Same as during World War II. People who got the notice about a person gone missing, they kept waiting for 40 or 50 years. What if we are lucky? He'll come back as a millionaire from somewhere. Maybe America. Convicting Petrushkin had taken nine months strenuous work. It had been very hard and stressful. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. An awful lot of work. And I shall never forget it. Well, for me it was the most serious case.